such a great pleasure to be here, and I am totally blown away by uh, CNS. I think the way that it brings people together from such diverse disciplines is really, really wonderful. And in our time, and given how science is developing, I think it's absolutely essential. So it's great. Now, what I want to do today is to say a little bit about how I see, with the emerging work in social neuroscience, how I see the relationship between moral behavior in mammals, humans and others, and what we know about the brain. And these are still early days. What I will do in the beginning is um, provide a certain amount of what I think is essential background, and then I'm going to skate fairly quickly over some fairly thin ice, uh, because I want to give you the big picture. And um, if I just sort of narrow it down and focus on data, even though um, I really am a, a, a bit of a, a data addict, if I do that, you won't get the big picture. So, so uh, Ed Wilson, a number of years ago, 1975, said that the evolution of sociality is the fundamental conundrum. And I think that by sociality, he really had in mind also moral behavior. And the, now I'm going to mean something fairly narrow by moral in this context, because we could, you know, talk till the cows come home about splitting hairs. What I'm going to mean in this context is just that a decision is thought to be a moral decision if, it, if I incur a cost to myself in order to benefit another. That's all I'm going to need. Now, of course, it's, there's other questions about whether or not I have moral obligations to myself, blah, 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 but I'm not going to talk uh, about that. And so it is a puzzle uh, how that can be. Now, oh yes, I've got two things to keep an eye on. Now, the first point I want to make is this, and that is that all animals have the wiring to support self-oriented care. We all have the wiring to see to our own food and water and warmth and safety. Were it not so, uh, our ancestors would not have survived and we would not be here. So it's an essential feature of natural selection that all animals have the wiring built into the very structure of the nervous system itself in order to support self-care. And this, I think, is an important point um, before talking about morals, because sometimes it seems as though values are just kind of added on. But when it comes to self-oriented values, they are part of the very nervous system itself. And as we will see, something a little bit like that is also true of values that are directed towards caring, sharing, and cooperation. Now, it has, I think, for many years, seemed to evolutionary biologists, oh, that's not quite where I thought it was, to evolutionary biologists, that it has seemed quite impossible that there could be changes in the nervous system that support social behavior, moral behavior. Because were such changes to occur, and I was really altruistic, and all of my friends were really selfish, I'd get eaten, my genes wouldn't be passed on, and so it would be. And so in the selfish gene, Dawkins makes this point, that we have to beat it into humans to be moral. Now, not everybody has thought this way. And interestingly enough, in 1871, when Darwin wrote The Descent of Man, he took a very different view. Darwin raised the question where our moral sense or conscience comes from. And that is my question. And his question, was, his answer was, there are three components. And I think he was dead right about that, too. There are instincts, there are skills and habits that are acquired postnatally in the context of social interactions. And finally, there is problem solving. And I'll have a little bit more to say about that later. Interestingly enough, I think this accords with a tradition in moral philosophy that has not really had status in the 20th century, the tradition of Aristotle, of course, 
and the two Scotsmen, David Hume and Adam Smith. Now, one quick background point, of course, I owe to the anthropologists. And it kind of sets the stage for how we might think about the nature of social interactions in our ancestors. So humans are thought to have been on the planet, that is, homo sapiens are thought to be on the planet, for about 200,000 to 250,000 years, a long time. And we, the other homo ancestors, such as Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalus, of course, were around much longer. It's very interesting that Homo erectus lived on the planet for about 1.8 million years. They lived in small groups, they had stone tools, they had fire, they built rafts, and they got themselves to Indonesia. They had rather small brains, about 800 cc's, yours is between 1300 and 1500 cc's. These groups, we infer from what we know about current hunter-gatherer scavenger groups, almost certainly had fixed social practices, or what you might call norms. And it was because they were engaged in caring, sharing, and cooperation that they were able to be as successful as they were. But in particular, what we do know about existing hunter-gatherer groups is that they almost certainly had no systematic, organized religion. And that it was really only with the advent of agriculture about 10,000 years ago that we see something very important change in human sociality. From small groups, which Robin Dunbar tells us can't be more than about 150 or we don't know everybody, from small groups to very large groups where many people don't know anybody else. And where in a small group, a certain amount of a glare or a, uh, a finger wag is quite enough to enforce the rules in a very large group where people may be off on their own, or they're not near their parents, they're not near people they know, that a systematic religion that has the idea that there is an unseen being who sees you when you're not around your auntie or your grandmother, and who knows whether or not you do bad things, becomes very important. And thus we see the idea <laughs> we see the idea of an unseen lawgiver. However, bear in mind, of course, that this may have been true for populations that emerged out of the Middle East, but it was not actually true of Asian religions. That by and large, Asian religions did not have the idea of a divine lawgiver who sees all and who keeps you in check. So the great uh, tradition included Mencius and Confucius, who had ideas that were not at all like those of, shall we say, Moses. They did not certainly think of themselves as divine. They did not think of themselves as handing down rules. They knew that life was very complex, and they knew that often what you have to do to teach people is teach them by imitation, through stories, through songs, and through discussion, but not by handing down a set of rules and saying you need to conform. And this was also, of course, true of the Buddha. Now, <clears throat> that was fast. <laughs> and now I want to move on to uh, a point in psychology. So, in the 60s, Eleanor Roche and somewhat later George Lakoff, in their analysis of everyday concepts, the ones we use in a casual way, found that by and large, everyday concepts appear to have a radial structure, by which they mean there are prototypes at the center, there are fuzzy boundaries, where you, know, you don't know whether the thing belongs in or not, but it doesn't really matter, and maybe there is no fact and in between, with declining similarity, is everything else. Now, most of you will know all this, so I'm going to go through it quickly. Uh, but in the West, the prototypical vegetable is a carrot. Most undergraduates will say carrot. What if I say, what's, you know, name the first vegetable that comes to your mind, then you will say carrot. 
but you know, a little bit, oh, the dad is radish. Well, some people don't think that a radish really is a vegetable. Yeah, it's found in the vegetable department of the supermarket, but who would eat such a thing? It's a garnish, and so forth. And then way out on the boundary are wild mushrooms. And um, sometimes you can find them in the supermarket. These are chanterelles, but are they really vegetables? Well, you know what? I never actually lose sleep over whether or not they're vegetables. I don't care, really. And my social life has not been severely impacted by my having no standing on this. Um, and I think uh, we will find that many moral concepts share this feature. But notice also that the notion of a dwelling has a radial structure. But it varies a little bit across cultures. There are, as Wittgenstein might have said, family similarities. But for the Inuit, uh, that constitutes a prototype. On the plains, maybe that. That was true for me, and so forth. Now, the reason I mention this is that I want to say something is true of these social concepts that we use in an everyday way with our children, with our friends, and when we're not trying to be philosophical. Oh, sorry, I think that was not supposed to be said. <laughs> anyway, when uh, children pick up what the category friend includes in a very loose and implicit way, similarly for what it is to be honest, to be kind, to be brave, to be trustworthy, and I think that's also true of what it is to be moral and not moral. Yes, there are boundary conditions. And sometimes when we really care, as in the context of a formal institution like the criminal justice system, then we make a decision and we define the boundary hard and fast. But for most of our life, we don't. So now, I'm going to tell you about moral philosophy in one slide. And, and you know, <laughs> yeah, I know this is really bad, but I want, as I said, to move on. So, <laughs> so roughly speaking, and I'm curving this up in a way that's quite different from how many moral philosophers currently do. There are really two basic traditions. One is derived from Moses and Aquinas. There's also Kant and Bentham. And theirs is really modeled on rules that are found within the criminal law itself, or within a codified legislation itself. A very different tradition, I've already alluded to, emphasizes the importance of skills and experience, of learning, revising, thinking it through, and so forth. By and large, this tends to apply quite well to a very restricted domain of our social life, the domain of the criminal justice system and the civil law and legislation. Not surprising. Whereas this, of course, is very messy. And out of this does not come what many people hanker for in moral philosophy, namely a supreme principle that applies to all people under all conditions, under all times. And these guys would actually say that the search for such a principle is futile, that there are always contingencies unforeseen by one generation but lived with by the next. And this seems to me, on the whole, to be the deeper account that, as I think of it, turns out to work quite well with what we're learning uh, in neuroscience. This is an interesting account that may or may not work. I'll leave that up uh, to legal scholars. And now I want to just say a little bit about non-human animals. And I think one of the really profound developments in science over the last maybe three decades has been the work by ecologists, both in the field and in captivity. And discovering, I mean, there have been so much that has been done, and in the most careful 
the sort of methodologically sensitive way. We see consolation behavior. We see reconciliation after defeat. We see pro-social behavior. A monkey is given a cup with two goodies in it, and his pal is there behind the cage. He can have them both himself, or he can give one to his pal and one to himself. Very often, not always, but this may be true of me too, uh, he takes one for himself and one for we see third party punishment, <clears throat> where a third party has nothing to gain from punishing the miscreant, but does it anyway. We see self-control, we see cooperation in hunting, we see, we see sharing of food, we see adoption. Chris Besch, who is a field anthropologist studying chimpanzees in the Ngogo region in Africa, has documented five cases of male chimpanzees adopting babies whose mother died. And this is a heroic thing, because as you all know, having, to, having responsibility for a baby is no small thing. And then immediately, of course, the biologists said, yeah, I bet they were the biological fathers, because otherwise, why would they? So they collected the pee of these guys and the pee of the babies. They did the DNA. They were not genetically the biological fathers, but they didn't. We see alloparenting of this kind in marmosets, and we see it in TT monkeys and in prairie voles, uh, who I will get to shortly. So of course, in part thanks to the wonderful Ed Wilson, sociology we know, or, uh, sociality we know has evolved many times. It's like color vision, which has evolved many times, not just once. But we think that in mammals and in birds, there is a kind of flexibility, a kind of um, removal from close dictates of the genetically set wiring that is quite different. Now, that doesn't mean there's no relationship to the genes. We just think that it's looser. So about 200 million years ago, something really amazing happened on the planet, and that is warm-blooded animals appeared. Well, that doesn't seem so amazing until you think about what life must have been like. And the great thing about being warm-blooded was that you could hunt at night when the other guys had to sleep and wait for the sun to come up to get their energy. Wonderful. The downside and this is the beginning of the story of mammalian sociality. The downside is that for a warm-blooded animal, for an endotherm, gram for gram, you have to eat 10 times as much as for a cold-blooded animal. This is a massive ecological constraint. It means the pressure is really on the endotherms. They have to really make it. Now, we also know then that a very small patch can support a whole lot of lizards, whereas for a mammal, uh, it has to be a much smaller patch. One of the things that happened as a result of endothermy, and we don't know the evolutionary story here, but one of the things that happened was the emergence of this wonder tissue, the neocortex. Mammals are the only creatures that have it. Okay, quick aside. Birds don't have a sixth lamina cortex, but the wiring in their lumpy kind of brain actually is very similar to and probably adheres to the same principles that produce the sixth lamina cortex uh, in mammals. But that's aside, and we can talk about that uh, later. But the point is that there is this highly structured and highly scalable bit of tissue that emerged with mammals. So not only then is it, and do you see this canonical circuitry with very specific cells, always in very specific places and going to very specific places. Nature can make more. It looks like you make a small change in the genes and you get more. Oh, you just fit it in. It's kind of like making stuff out of Lego, right? You go out and you just, oh, I think maybe I'll make a bit more, and you just add some on and some more. And, oh, maybe this isn't so good, and you 
And so scalability together with this highly organized structure turned out to be important. So that's wonderful. It probably allowed them to do all kinds of things. But there is a downside. The downside is that for cortex to work its magic, it has to be very, very immature when the child is born or the, the baby is born. Because what it does then is it tunes itself up to the environment. It learns about the causal relations in the world it happens to be in. And that's very different from what goes on if you're a termite or an ant, army ant. So this slide just reminds us that at birth, there may be a very specific number of neurons. Their dendrites and their axons begin to branch in response to the environment. And in certain ways that we now are beginning to understand, they map the environment. And they get, of course, more and more and more dense. There are also periods of pruning. Just So the magic of the cortex is that it has this computational capacity but it has it really only once it begins to map the world that it finds itself in. So where are we in this story? Well, where we are then is that once you're an endotherm and you got yourself cortex, then your learning capacity goes way up, but your newborn independence goes down. So whereas a mother turtle will lay her eggs and then she'll go off and uh, sit in the sun and that's the end of it, that's not how it works with any mammal or any bird. Even precocial mammals like goats and sheep have to take care of the young because the young can't feed themselves uh, or defend themselves. All right, so something very different happened to the brains of mothers who were the closest adults around to take care of these helpless offspring. The wiring changed in order to make the mother care and to feel good about caring. Now remember that wiring that's involved in self-care. Basically it looks like what happened with mammals and birds is that wiring is slightly repurposed, extended, and expanded to include the offspring. And to ensure that that happens, there are a number of changes. Uh, and one of, there are many changes, but one of the ones that we're going to dwell on here is the role of oxytocin. So there's a massive amount of oxytocin released at birth both in the brain of the mother and in the brain of uh, the baby. Oxytocin is a very ancient uh, um, peptide, but in mammals and birds, it's put to new use. And so when, um, when the mother and the baby are together and they have this release of oxytocin in their brains, as well actually as in their bodies, they feel good being together, and the bonding between mother and offspring is facilitated by the presence of all of this oxytocin. And you can block mother-infant bonding in rodents, for example, and in sheep, by blocking the receptors for oxytocin. And it's sort of, oh, well, who's this then? Mm -hmm. um, so we know that it's very important, but it's not the only important thing. The endocannabinoids and the opioids that your brain makes play a huge role also in making you feel good. The mother feels pain when the infant falls out of the nest and does whatever she can to correct that feeling of pain, like grabbing the pup and putting it back in the nest, whereupon her oxytocin levels go up again and she feels good. Oxytocin is released in, there are many people here in, uh, at Penn who, who work on social neuroscience, so this will be old news for them. Uh, who work, uh, the oxytocin is released from this ancient structure, the hypothalamus. It's released mainly in uh, the supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus, but it's also released 
into the pituitary and then into the body itself. And there's some also that goes into the spinal cord. And it turns out, I think it's very cool actually, it's got nothing really to do with sociality, that it plays an important role in counteracting inflammation in the spinal cord and reducing pain. So maybe that's why when somebody touches you and, no, oh, it's okay, it'll get better, it'll get better, you get a shot of oxytocin, and some of that goes into the spinal cord, and lo and behold, some of the pain does decrease. So I mentioned that there is a role for the endocannabinoids, which uh, have come into their own much later than the study of the opioids. But we're realizing now that the endocannabinoids play an extremely important role in the pleasure we feel uh, in sociality and bonding and so forth. Uh, well, that just shows you where the, some of the endorphins and kephalins and so forth are. And notice, because I'll talk about this later, that there are some in the ventral tegmental area. This is going to be an area that turns out to be absolutely critical for reinforcement learning, for reward and punishment. Ah, yes. And the amygdala, which also part of it has an important role in the feelings of pleasure and the feelings of reward uh, when we get things right. Just a quick thing, because I really love this slide. I know I really don't have time. But in Allison's lab in Sweden, they made this discovery a few years ago. So I don't know exactly how they came to do it, but they noticed that when you go like this, there's a subclass of very old fibers, the C fibers, that are unmyelinated. And they respond, this subclass, not to pain, but to stroking, to social stroking, and to stroking at a certain velocity. Not this, mm -hmm. and not this but what you do when you pet your dog, or when somebody pets you, or what have you. <laughs> and it seems, I mean, we don't think of this as an important part of sociality, but think about the role that grooming plays in uh, chimpanzees and bonobos and baboons and so forth, and in your dog. <clears throat> part of what happens then is that these fibers are being activated and it feels wonderful. Okay, so the hypothesis, just to kind of pull it together a little bit again, is that mammalian and avian sociability is valuable. And those values get embedded into the very structure of that part of the brain that changes in response to the environment that the platform for sociality and hence for morality, for caring, sharing, and cooperation, the platform is oxytocin and related, the endocannabinoids and related. And finally, of course, what about norms? Because norms vary across cultures, just as houses do and boats do and so forth. And so one question we want to address here then is it looks like many cultures develop norms of one kind or another. How do those norms come to be? And what about the brain that changes in response to learning norms? So partly then what we're going to do is consider again the basic wiring for self-oriented values, how those get extended to kin, and how under certain circumstances they can also be extended beyond kin, maybe to mates, maybe to uh, aunties and uncles and sisters, but extended beyond that to friends, or to use the old Scots term, um, to kin. So here's the story of the prairie voles, which most people will know at least a little bit, but uh, I'll go over it very quickly, just because it is a hugely important story. And, and actually, when I thought about it afterwards in the Colbert show when I told the story, some of you will know this. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this a bit in a minute. Okay. So, prairie voles. Many species of voles, montane voles and prairie voles, seem very similar, except that in the case of montane voles, they're kind of like our stereotype rodent, right? The male and the female meet, 
they mate, and then they go their separate ways. And then we think, well, we're about that. But anyway, then there's the prairie voles. And the prairie voles come along and they mate, they mate, and then they're born with the fly. It does not imply sexual exclusivity, but close to. And so the question was, what's the difference in the brain? And here was where Colbert said, the prairie voles are Christians. <laughs> And I thought it was an interesting answer later, but I thought, I mean, I just thought it was funny at the time. But I mean, it, 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 it is an assumption we have that monogamy and long-term pair bonding are something that's pretty sophisticated and that we have because our reason tells us this is a good way to go and somehow or other we do it. Yeah. All right. So in looking at the, de the brains of montane voles and prairie voles to try to understand the difference in the brain, Larry Young and other people, uh, Sue Carter and so forth, um, did finally come to an answer about what we think is the predominant difference. There are going to be lots of others. So you're looking at a coronal section through the montane vole brain and the prairie vole brain. OTR means oxytocin receptor, vasopressin receptor. Vasopressin is the kind of sibling peptide uh, to oxytocin. So what do you see? And the answer is, look at the prairie vole, look at the nucleus accumbens, that critical part of the reward system. It turns out that this section, in, this stuff in black, are receptors for oxytocin that are stained. So when you look, you say, ah, oh, there's a lot of receptors for oxytocin in the nucleus accumbens, and what about over here? Hardly any. And they found this in vole after vole. And for vasopressin, again, they found receptors for vasopressin in the prairie vole, and another part of the reward system, a very specific part, the ventral palatal. They did, interestingly, and I'll come back to this, because it's kind of curious, they found a density of receptors in the lateral septum. And yet these guys are the non-social ones. All right. So this lateral septum density of receptors for, for vasopressin, for oxytocin sometimes, what's that all about? So Annalisa Bureau and her group at Smith raised this question in the context of another vole species. And these are meadow voles. So meadow voles appear to be solitary until you watch them closely. So in the summer, they are solitary. The female has the baby, she takes care of them. But as winter approaches, they become more and more social. During the winter, they huddle together, they stay with each other, they play together, and so forth. So what she did was looked at the lateral septum. And it turns out that she would see a high density of oxytocin receptors in the lateral septum in the summertime when they were not social. And then they would decrease over the summer into the fall, and there'd be few in the winter. Now, the interesting part of the story here, and this it will be a surprise to the neuroscientists, is that it's not the chemical itself, right? It's the way the chemical interacts with the neurons, with the neural net, and so forth. So when Paul Zak calls oxytocin the love molecule, of course he's not really thinking about oxytocin that binds to receptors in the lateral septum. So the circuitry, this reminds us, of course, is ultimately uh, what matters. Okay, so a recent paper um, 2014 in uh, Zuberbluter's lab in uh, Scotland told us it's something very interesting. So the, the reason I found this interesting is this. Is you think about, well, so you can see how it is that with a small genetic change, you can get something like attachment and bonding between mates. But, but how do you get that from there to caring about others in your family? How do you get from there to caring about friends or even to strangers? And I think we've all, I mean, we don't know what the genetic story is, but here's a bit of behavioral data that's important. 
it turns out that in the context of food sharing, especially food sharing with an animal that you're not already bonded to, the oxytocin levels go way up. Now, we also know they go up during uh, grooming. But when they food share, this is obviously really important, the oxytocin levels go way up. So something very important happens when we engage with others, when we groom, when we chat, when we uh, food share, and so forth. Now, what exactly does oxytocin do? Apart from the answer, many things. There are things we, of course, don't know. But one of the things we know is this, that in normal social contexts, when oxytocin levels go up, then cortisol levels go down. Cortisol, and when cortisol goes up, that's what makes you feel anxious, you're vigilant, you're worried, blue, and it doesn't put you in, shall we say, a trusting, friendly mode. But when cort levels fall and oxytocin levels go up, then we're more able to relax, we're more able to probably secrete the endocannabinoids that make us feel good when we are grouped. Now that's only part of the story of the relationship between cort and uh, oxytocin. Biology is nothing if not complex, but it gives us a door to open. Okay, now the other thing that I think is important in this context is that because we have this platform where sociality makes us feel good, we can often with individuals to whom we have no genetic connection. We can still enjoy a pleasurable relationship. We can still enjoy the satisfactions and joys of caring, sharing, and cooperation. And of course, there are many examples. This is, is interesting to me because it's not just cross mammalian species, but birds, uh, a bird and a dog. So this was a uh, runty owl, it was the number six in the clutch. It hatched much later than the left rest and was kind of left behind. It was rescued and brought home. And very quickly there developed a very powerful bond between the dog and this tiny owl who he could have eaten in a moment. Uh, and there they are all kind of cuddled up together. But there are many, many examples. You can just go on YouTube and you see all these wonderful examples of, there's quite a great one of uh, chimpanzee, uh, orphan chimpanzee being brought home from the zoo. And the mother dog had just given birth, so she had all kinds of pups and milk. And the, the chimpanzee baby just latched right on. All right. Of course, our self-oriented values, our desires to take care of ourselves and make sure we ourselves thrive, uh, never go away. And that's partly why we see various kinds of norms in the hunter-gatherer scavenger societies uh, emerge. And there are differences, of course, partly as a function of ecology, but partly also as a function of their uh, particular habits. And here the story goes something like this, that the reward system will be engaged in a very strong way in the learning of social norms and rules. Not unless, of course, we have this platform that makes us care. Right? So if a kid doesn't care whether he's excluded, whether he's isolated, whether he is uh, sent home, if he doesn't care, if he doesn't feel the pain of being ostracized, he's not going to learn norms. We, can, we learn norms and we want to do things the way others in the group do because we have this social platform rooted in the story of oxytocin and the cannabinoids. Now, another one of the great stories of neuroscience, I think, in the last um, roughly three decades, has been the greatly increased, but still incomplete, study of the reinforcement learning system. And uh, the, the important structure is the one I mentioned earlier, the ventral tegmental area. And you can see in this highly schematic diagram, 
it projects to the, to the ventral pallidum, which is where the density of receptors for vasopressin reside, and in the amygdala, in the nucleus accumbens, and of course in the cortex. Um, and punishment seems to be guided not so much by those structures, but by the lateral habenula, which all again projects very widely. So one of the things then that we think now is that the reinforcement learning system doesn't just do this sort of crappy, dumbass, creepy little association things that we, that we were taught in the 19th century, or much by association. It looks like you learn a lot using your reinforcement learning system, especially as it, the way it is connected to all of these other structures. Uh, including the <coughs> cortex. And we've been motivated to think this, at least in part because deep learning has shown us, I mean, I don't want to get sort of wildly enthusiastic about deep learning because there's all kinds of problems with it, but one of the things that we learned about deep learning when the neural network AlphaGo beat the Go, world Go champion, Lee at all. And we really looked hard at what that machine had learned to do, is it learned strategies, it learned rules, it learned norms. And many of these rules that we pick up, we humans pick up, as children, we may not even be aware of. We learn them implicitly. This is the way uh, you make sushi. This is the way you behave at a funeral. This is the way you, and so on, uh, and so forth. So just to give a, a little bit of a summary then, cortex seems to be the signature structure of mammals. It's very, very, very uh, immature when we're born. The genes sort of see to the basic, very basic aspects of the wiring. Uh, and then it builds like crazy. And then it will reflect whatever world you happen to be in. So I realize that that means that my brain is going to be very different from the brain of a human ancestor that lived 200,000 years ago. We're pretty sure, based on genetic studies, that the sequencing of the DNA is pretty similar. That uh, the differences in DNA between Homo sapiens of 250,000 years ago and me are really all about digestion, maybe skin color, maybe hair texture, a couple of other enzymes, but they do not appear to involve anything about cognition, which is pretty interesting. We don't know um, all that much about the Neanderthals, except, of course, that they did interbreed with humans. You'll be happy to know that I am 4.9% Neanderthal, according to 23andMe. I thought that was quite fun. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Um, actually, well, I will, I'll end with this slide. So if animals like to be together, this is kind of to go back to my idea that when you're comfortable with others, when then caring and sharing and cooperation can emerge. It, there doesn't have to be a gene for cooperation. So in this slide, what we have are a pair of wolves out somewhere in the Arctic, and they're calling all the rest of the pack. And they're calling the pack because the pack then follows a raven maybe for a couple of days even. And how does it know to follow the raven? Because the raven does something that Tinbergen actually saw a raven do. It would waggle its tail and then look and then hop, and then the wolves know the raven found something. And it will follow the raven as the raven goes tree to tree to tree. This doesn't happen in all wolf packs. This is learned. And when it gets to the spot the raven wanted it to be, and there's the raven there, there indeed is the grizzly with a carol, yum yum. So the wolves, there's only one, one grizzly, the wolves harass and harass and harass until finally the grizzly had got some and he takes off. So 
an amazing kind of interspecies cooperation. But of course, what's in it for this guy? So it turns out that the raven uh, flies off, gets all his pals, the ravens come in by the dozens, and then they harass and harass and harass <laughs> the wolves. And I don't know if you've ever been close to a raven, but they're quite amazing. They have these massively long bills that are razor sharp, and the wolves can't, can't manage. And they cave in, and they leave, and the ravens get their fill. Now, all of these things contribute in a small way, I think, to our understanding of our moral behavior as complicated, but as fundamentally rooted in the kind of biological creature that we actually are. And that there are very specific pathways and very specific kinds of neurochemicals <coughs> that play a role. <coughs> the one thing I did not talk about was the nature of problem solving. And the role of problem solving especially in the context of social problems. How do hunter-gatherer scavenger groups come to solve particular problems uh, that they have? How do they light upon doing it this way rather than that way? And I think there, we really don't know yet. But I'm hopeful that we will. Namaste.